Okay, are you ready to dive into one of those theological topics that can really make your head spin? Oh, I know the feeling. We're talking free will, predestination, God's sovereignty. The big questions. The big ones. And you know what? The Reformed view on all this, it's surprisingly thought-provoking. Yeah. Even maybe especially if it kind of pushes back on some of our initial, you know, assumptions. What I find so captivating is that it really forces us to examine those preconceived notions about free will. Like, do we really have as much control as we think we do? Right. And the reform perspective, it takes this, well, this unique approach. It says, yeah, we have a will, sure, but it's not exactly um, free when it comes to actually seeking God. It's almost like, imagine trying to win a game that's already rigged, you know? <laughs> okay, I see where you're going with it. So how does that work? Our source material uses some pretty strong language about this, talking about our wills being like, enslaved to sin <laughs> it doesn't exactly sound like a feel-good message does it <laughs> not really that's kind of intense what's the deal with that well that's where this whole concept of total depravity comes in now before everyone starts picturing humanity as just completely evil right right it simply means that because of the fall you know adam and eve back in the garden our very nature our will included it's inclined towards sin so it's not that we're all just inherently bad people, but that there's this kind of inherent pull towards sin that that messes with our ability to, to choose God on our own. Exactly. Think of it like a compass. It's supposed to point north. Right. right. But because of, say, a powerful magnetic field, it always veers off course. That's kind of like our wills after the fall. We're naturally inclined to move away from God, not towards him. So it's not a level playing field, is it? We've got this sin magnet thing going on. But... If our default is to resist God, to kind of shy away, how does anyone choose him? It almost feels impossible. Well, that's where this idea of election comes into play. This is where things get really interesting. You see, if you can't choose God on our own, he must be the one doing the choosing. So are you saying God is like handpicking who gets saved and who doesn't? Like there's some kind of divine selection process going on? Essentially, yes. Election is God's sovereign choice of who will be saved. And it's not based on anything we've done to earn it. Like Ephesians 1.4 to 5 puts it this way. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. It's according to his own purpose and grace, not ours. Okay, so it's not like God's peeking into the future, sees who's behaving and says, okay, you're in. It's more like he's making this choice from like from the get-go, right? Yeah. Out of his own will. Exactly. Romans 9.113 tells the story of Jacob and Esau. You know, God loved Jacob and chose him even before they were born. And this choice, it wasn't because Jacob was somehow more deserving, but purely because of God's, you know, his sovereign decision. See, this is where I think a lot of people might struggle, myself included. It can feel a bit like a cosmic lottery where we have, like, zero say in the matter. Is that, mm. I mean, is that fair? It's a question that's challenged theologians for centuries. But here's a crucial point. The Bible is clear that none of us actually deserve God's grace. Yeah, we're not exactly winning any most righteous awards down here. Not at all. Romans 3.23, it reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God would be completely just, in, just you know, condemning us all. But because of his, well, his immense mercy, he chooses to extend grace to some. So, Electa, it isn't about God being unfair, but about... Him showing, like, incredible, almost unimaginable mercy, even though, let's be honest, none of us actually deserve it. Precisely. It highlights the sheer depth of his grace and love. Wow. Okay. And you know what? We're going to unpack this concept even further in just a bit. Okay. So we've, we've established that God chooses us. It's a tough one to fully wrap our heads around, you know. But if God chooses us, does that mean our whole lives are, like pre-programmed, like we're following some kind of divine script. Yeah. And that's where predestination comes in, right? You got it. <laughs> and, you know, predestination often gets kind of lumped together with election, but they are distinct, interconnected pieces of this whole puzzle. So think of it this way. Election, that focuses specifically on God's choice of who will be saved. Predestination, that's the panoramic view. God's eternal plan for, well, everything, every little detail woven together. So election is like this one really, really significant chapter in this grand narrative of God's plan. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, it goes even deeper than just God, like knowing the future. The Reformed view, it emphasizes that God's foreknowledge isn't passive. 
he's not just watching things unfold like a spectator. He's actively orchestrating everything. Wow. Yeah. Romans 8.29 tells us God foreknew those he predestined. And that word foreknew in the original Greek, it implies like this pre-existing love and plan, not just a simple awareness of what's going to happen. Okay, so it's more than just a heads up. It's like it's active. He's involved. Exactly. And this brings us to a concept that, well, that can be a bit tougher to, to understand. It's called double predestination. Now, stick with me on this one. Okay, right? I'm here. Because this is one that tends to raise a few eyebrows. Right, I see why. Double predestination acknowledges that God's decree, it includes both election to salvation, right, for some, and then, well, reprobation, or you might say passing over for others. Okay, so this is where I can imagine some listeners might be thinking, hold on a minute. If God decides who's saved and who isn't from the very beginning, how is that fair? Is he, like, creating people just to condemn them? Which is, I mean, it's a natural question to ask when you're trying to wrap your head around this. Totally. And it's an understandable reaction. But here's a, a really important clarification that Reformed theology emphasizes. God doesn't create people just to condemn them. And he doesn't force them to sin. Okay, so that's a big misconception to clear up right there. It is. It is. Instead, in his sovereignty... God allows humanity to follow while well, their naturally sinful inclinations. Remember, we talked about that compass earlier. The one with the sin magnet. Exactly. Right? The one all wonky because of the sin magnet. So yeah. God, in his infinite knowledge, he allows his natural consequence of free will to, to play out. So our natural inclination, because of sin, is to kind of stray from God. And God could intervene, but he chooses to, to allow us to make those choices, even if those choices lead us away from him. You got it. However difficult it is for us to you know, fully grasp the concept of double predestination. It exists alongside this equally important truth, God's justice and mercy, even if our, our finite minds sometimes struggle to, to fully reconcile those concepts. So we're holding these two, these two kind of seemingly contradictory ideas in tension, that God is completely sovereign, totally in control, yet at the same time, we're still accountable for our choices and actions. How do those two things coexist? It's a head scratcher for sure. And that tension, that's really at the very heart of the Reformed perspective. And it's definitely a, a stumbling block for many. It feels like a paradox. But Reformed tradition asserts that both are undeniably true. So it's not an either or, but a both and kind of situation, even if it stretches our understanding a bit. It's about embracing the complexity. Yes. And consider the crucifixion of Jesus. In Acts 2.23, we read that it happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So it was part of God's plan from the get-go. But, and this is crucial, those who actually carried it out were still held responsible. They were accountable for their choices, for their actions. That's a, that's a powerful illustration. God's sovereignty didn't erase the responsibility of those involved, right? Right. It highlights how God can work through even, even the most difficult of human choices to accomplish his purposes. Wow. Okay. So bringing it back to, to the forefront of our conversation... If God initiates our salvation, how does that like how does that work on a practical level? If our natural bend is to resist him, how does his call, you know, actually get through? How does that change happen? The key and it's kind of funny to call it a key because it's such a well, a magnificent, mysterious thing, but the key is what's known as irresistible grace. Okay. That sounds intense. Does that mean God's up there with like a spiritual cattle prod forcing us to believe? Cuz that doesn't sound much like free will at all. No, not at all. It's not about coercion. It's not about overriding our free will. Irresistible grace means that when God calls his elect, his call is so powerful, so deeply, deeply transformative that it overcomes our natural resistance. It's not that we lose the ability to say no. It's that God's grace changes our hearts to the point where we want to say yes. Our yeah. desires are changed. Yeah, it's definitely been like a whirlwind tour through some pretty heavy theological territory. It has. But you know what I find so fascinating about all of this? It's not about like having all the answers, you know, perfectly figured out. Right. It's about letting these concepts really sink in and shape our understanding of, of who God is, how much he loves us. I love that because it really is about encountering these ideas and letting them change us. You know, it's yeah. not about just having the right answers. Exactly. And that leads to a question that I bet is on a lot of listeners' minds right now. Hmm. If this view of salvation, with God as the initiator and us responding to his grace, if this is true, how should it actually impact the way we live our lives? 
Like, does it even matter what we do if it's, well, if it's already, you know, chosen? Ah, uh, the million dollar question, right. It would be easy to kind of sit back and go, well, if it's all predecided, then why bother, right? Yep. But, but that kind of misses the whole point, wouldn't you say? Totally. Yeah. It seems like, if anything, the natural response should be like the opposite, like understanding this incredible love that God has for us, this love that predestined us, called us, sustains us, that should actually motivate us even more. Yes, exactly. You see, when we truly grasp, I mean, truly grasp the magnitude of God's love for us, it should ignite this deep, deep desire within us to reflect that love back to him and to, to let it flow out into the world. So it's not about like kicking back and passively waiting for heaven, yeah. right? It's about actively participating in our faith, knowing that God's working in and through us each step of the way. It's not like we're off the hook just because... He's the one who made it possible. Exactly. And not out of obligation either, right. but out of out of this overflowing gratitude and joy that comes from from knowing how much we're loved. It's about allowing our lives to be transformed by that grace, about wanting to serve others, to show love because, well, because we've experienced that love ourselves. It's like this incredible paradox, isn't it? The more we understand God's sovereignty, the more it should compel us to live lives of of humble service and love. Oh, I love that. A beautiful mystery. And like any good mystery, it invites us to keep exploring, to keep seeking deeper understanding, to grow in our appreciation for, for God's immeasurable grace. So well said. And as we wrap up this deep dive into some, let's be honest, some pretty deep theological waters. He'd been to the pool for sure. I'm reminded that, that wrestling with these big questions of faith it's a journey, not a destination, right? It is. It's about approaching these topics with, with humility, you know, yeah. with openness and with a willingness to kind of have our minds stretched a bit. Yes. Don't shy away from the tough stuff, guys. Lean into those questions. Wrestle with them. Exactly. So if anything we've talked about today has, has sparked your curiosity, if you're feeling that urge to kind of delve even deeper, we encourage you to check out the source material for this episode. Remember, this isn't about checking boxes or memorizing doctrines. It's about letting these truths shape how we see ourselves, our world, and ultimately our awesome God. And on that note, until next time, keep asking those tough questions. Keep seeking truth. Keep diving deep into the wonders of faith. This whole free will thing, you know, mm -hmm. it really gets people going, especially when you throw predestination into the mix. And you're jumping right into the deep end with this, looking at Reformed theology. Definitely a deep dive. For sure. We're looking at some excerpts you pulled on this, and it seems like the question you're wrestling with is a big one, one that's been around for centuries. How say do we actually have in our salvation? It's a biggie. It really gets to the core of how we see ourselves in relation to God, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And the source material you've been looking at, well, it doesn't mess around. It leads out this idea of God's sovereignty, like, He's completely in control, calling all the shots. Exactly. Reform theology really emphasizes that God's will is the ultimate cause of everything, and that includes our salvation. Okay, see, now that's where I get tripped up a bit. Because if God is totally in control, like you said, does that mean we're just, you know, robots? Following a pre-programmed plan? What about our everyday choices? Like this morning, I chose to have another cup of coffee. Did God plan that too? It's a totally natural question to ask. Yeah. In the text you're looking at, it acknowledges that humans do have a will. We're not puppets. Okay, good. I was getting a little worried there. But, There's always a but, isn't there? Well, yeah. You see, Reformed theology has this concept called total depravity. Okay, before we go any further, can we unpack that a bit? Because, wow, that sounds kind of intense. It can sound pretty heavy, I know, but it's actually a pretty profound idea when you really get into it. Think of it this way, okay? Our will is like, say, a computer's operating system, right? Okay, I'm with that. So when it was first created, it was perfect, running smoothly, making good choices. But then sin came along, and sin, that's like a virus. It infected the system, you know, corrupted the code, messed with the programming. So you're saying our operating system is, what, glitching out? Yeah, exactly. We still have a will, we still make choices, but those choices... They're influenced by this underlying, well, corruption. Think about trying to run a complex program on a computer that's full of malware. You might be able to get some things done, but the system isn't working the way it should. Okay, I think I see where you're going to this. So even if we think we're making free choices, they're actually being swayed by this, like you said, the sin virus. Precisely. And that's where the text draws a distinction between our will before the fall, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, and our will after sin entered the picture. Oh, right. Back when choices were as easy as apple or no apple. 
simpler times. Right. They had what we call libertarian free will, a real ability to choose obedience or disobedience. But once sin showed up, our will, well, it got a lot more complicated. So we're left dealing with the fallout of this, like, cosmic system crash. But here's the thing. If our will is all messed up like we've been talking about, how can we ever choose God? That doesn't seem right, does it? That's the big question, isn't it? And this is where Reformed theology, I'll be honest, it might seem a little out there at first. It says we can't choose God, not on our own anyway, not that God's being unfair or anything, but the text argues our system, if you want to call it that, it's so messed up by that sin virus, remember, that we can't even seek him out without his help. So like that computer trying to run the latest software, it's just not going to happen without a serious upgrade. Exactly. And that upgrade, that's where God's grace comes in. And that leads us to two really big ideas in Reformed theology. Election and irresistible grace. Two concepts that people talk about a lot. Okay, election. Whenever I hear that word, I think about, you know, being back in school, getting picked for teams in gym class. Nobody wants to be the last one chosen. And we're not <laughs> just talking about dodgeball here. We're talking about eternal life. So, yeah, the stakes are a little higher. You're right. It's a big deal. And the source you're looking at, it gets that. It makes it clear that election doesn't mean God is just up there picking favorites, you know, deciding who's in and who's out, like yeah. it's all random or something. It's not like he's some kind of divine puppet master. Okay, so then what's the deal with election? If God's not just picking winners and losers, what does it even mean? Well, the text defines it as basically God in his infinite wisdom, choosing certain people to receive his grace. And get this, it's a grace so powerful it can break through even the most hardcore malware and draw us to him. Hold on, irresistible grace. Are you saying we don't even get a choice about it? That word irresistible, yeah, it definitely throws people off, but it doesn't mean God drags us kicking and screaming into a relationship with him, you know? It's more like he's offering us an upgrade and it's such a profound life-changing upgrade that, well, our hearts are just drawn to it. Think back to that infected computer we were talking about. Imagine if, instead of letting it crash, a tech whiz came along and offered a complete system overhaul. For free! It wouldn't be about forcing the computer to accept it. It's that the offer itself would be so good, so obviously what that computer needs, that it'd be irresistible. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. It's not about being forced, but about how powerful what God offers really is. Yeah. But, and I gotta ask this, I bet this is what's keeping you up at night. Yeah. How do we know if we've received that irresistible grace? How do I know if I'm one of the elect? Because, you know, if it's all up to God, there's a part of me that just wants to know where I stand. It's the million dollar question, right? And you're definitely not alone in asking it. The text you've been reading, you even wrote it down, didn't you? Yeah. How do I know if I am elect? Seems like you've been wrestling with this yourself. It's like we're standing at the bottom of this huge theological mountain looking up at this idea of election. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed, even a little lost. So where do we go from here? Well, the text doesn't offer a formula or a checklist, and maybe that's the point. Instead of getting bogged down and trying to decode some divine algorithm, it seems to suggest a different approach. Okay, I'm intrigued. What's the alternative? Remember how we talked about sin being like a virus corrupting our system? Well, this text seems to imply that instead of obsessing over whether we've been cured or not, we should be looking for the symptoms of recovery. Symptoms of recovery, what do you mean? Instead of asking, how do I know if I'm elect? Maybe the question becomes, what does it look like to live in the light of God's grace, whether or not I fully grasp the mystery of his selection? So instead of searching for a golden ticket to heaven, we should be looking for evidence of God's work in our lives. Exactly. The text points to things like a transformed heart, a desire for holiness, a growing love for God. These aren't just check marks on a spiritual to-do list, but genuine outworkings of God's grace transforming us from the inside out. So it's not about saying the right prayer or believing all the right things. It's about those deep down changes, those shifts in our desires and affections that maybe, just maybe, point to something truly remarkable happening within us. You've hit the nail on the head. It's about recognizing that if we find ourselves drawn to the things of God, yearning for his presence, grieving over our sin, that might be the subtle yet undeniable work of his grace already at work within us. And you mentioned struggling with procrastination. If you're truly bothered by that and want to change, according to Reformed theology, that desire itself could be seen as evidence of God's grace working in you. Wow, that really puts a different spin on things. It's like, instead of worrying about whether we're good enough, we're invited to look for glimmers of hope, for signs of life in those dry and weary places within ourselves. And perhaps that's where true freedom lies. 
not in the anxiety of, am I chosen, but in the surrender to a God who is bigger than our understanding, yet intimately acquainted with the deepest longings of our hearts. It's like we're shifting from a place of fear and uncertainty to a place of awe and wonder. It's not about having all the answers, but about trusting the one who holds them all. And in that trust, we find the courage to live, to love, to serve, not out of obligation, but out of the overflow of a heart that's been touched by grace. So as we wrap up this deep dive into Reformed theology, I think the biggest takeaway is this. The next time you find yourself wrestling with those big questions about free will and predestination, instead of getting lost in the what-ifs, maybe take a moment to simply breathe in the reality of God's grace. Let it wash over you, seep into those cracks and crevices of your heart, and see if it doesn't change the way you see yourself, your world, and the God who holds it all together. And if this conversation has sparked even more questions, even more curiosity about this whole free will and predestination thing, that's fantastic. Because ultimately, it's in the wrestling and the seeking and the never-ending exploration of our faith that we discover the God who is beyond comprehension, yet closer than our very breath.